In this lecture, we will learn about South Asian art before 1200, looking at the Gupta and Pallava periods. During this period, we see the first influential forms of Hinduism, as well as the earliest Hindu temples that survive from this period. This occurred during the same time that Christianity was spreading. Let's next look at the creation story of Hinduism. In the beginning, Hindus believed Ganga flowed in the heavens, but she was held captive by the creator god, Brahma. Then Brahma decided to send the river Ganga down to earth. But there is one problem, that Ganga has got such mighty force, and if she comes on the earth, the earth will drown. So the god Shiva blocked Ganga's fall, gathering her waters in the locks of his hair. So Shiva just opened one lock of his hair, and the Ganga flew. She's the mother, because she gives birth to everything. This holy river came from the river in heaven that we call the Milky Way. They say that Milky Way actually is a reflection that you see in those waters which are still beyond. Scientists have dated the universe to about 14 billion years, best we can figure. Hindus have it at what? Hindus do not believe in one creation. They say that these are cycles of creation. Okay. And the primordial creation could be something like 8.6 billion years ago. Actually, this whole creation myth is very difficult to comprehend because we say that gods, like Brahma has created the universe. But then they ask a question, who created Brahma? Right. And That's then... Always a question, then. Creation happened and then the gods happened. They say that the sages, when they were in their trance, they got that revelation that how the creation happened. But since it is in that level of consciousness, you and me, we commoners, will not understand it. So we believe that it's beyond us. There are several deities in Hinduism. It is not just one religion, but consists of numerous beliefs. The Vedic beliefs are combined with indigenous. One has a wide variety of choices. Families or people choose one deity that they are more comfortable with. In India, there are a variety of images representing numerous deities, all that come from the same entity or idea. All draw on Veda's text. The gods lie outside of our world, but can also appear here. We can see them and interact with them. Each sect has a particular supreme deity, similar to the Mesopotamian gods in which each city had one primary god. Worship of gods is necessary in Hinduism so that you can be reborn into higher positions and escape samsara. The gods are represented in various forms. The most popular three are Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma. Vishnu is considered the benevolent god who works for order and well-being of the world. He is the creator and preserver of the universe. He is often shown lying in trance on cosmic waters where he dreamed the world into existence. His incarnations include Krishna and Rama. Shiva is dual-natured, for example, can be creative or destructive, light or dark, male or female, ascetic or family man. Often shown as Lord of the Dance and Cosmic Dance. This is a forever endless cycle of death, rebirth, destruction, and creation. Parvati is his lover, and together they have two sons. One is Ganesha, 
the elephant headed remover of obstacles. Shiva can also take many forms and is known as the great yogi or teacher. Shiva is seen dancing on a dwarf. The dwarf is the demon of ignorance. He is also androgynous. Periodically, he destroys the universe so that it can be recreated from the drum held in one of his right hands. And his third eye is all-knowing. The son of Shiva in Parvati is Ganesha, the elephant-headed remover of obstacles, also the god of good fortune. He is recognized by his elephant head, which has a story behind it. Ganesha was asked to guard the house while his mother Parvati was gone. Shiva arrives and he and Ganesha had never met. As a result, Shiva cuts off the head of Ganesha. When Parvati returns, she asks Shiva to restore Ganesha's head. So Shiva goes outside and takes the head of the first animal that he sees, which was that of an elephant. Brahma is known for spiritual wisdom. The four heads represent four cosmic cycles, four directions, four classes of society, for instance, priests, warriors, merchants, and laborers. There are countless deities in Hinduism, all worshipped similarly. Puja is a form of worship, and Darshan is beholding a deity. The four classes of society that Hindu developed beyond that of previous civilizations. During the 4th century, Vedic sacrifices would eventually be replaced by temple-based practices. The Brahmin priest would also build temples dedicated to the deities. The Hindu temple is a home for the deity, a sacred space where worshiper can encounter the divine. It's designed to represent mountains, which has symbolism as the world axis that connects the heaven and earth. One chamber inside the Garbhagriha is known as the womb chamber, a sacred cavern within the cosmic mountain where the God resides. There are two types of Hindu temples. The northern style will look more like a mountain and the southern style is more flat and represents the typography where it developed. Here we see Vishnu lying on the cosmic waters, which relates to the creation story in Hinduism. Vishnu is sleeping on the serpent of infinity, Ananta, whose body coils endlessly. There are Krobas above the head of Vishnu and the coils are like pillows underneath. Here is a common depiction of the scene. Here, Lakshmi is seen at the feet inspiring Vishnu. She is the Hindu goddess of wealth and good fortune. Brahma is at the top, born out of a lotus blossom from Vishnu's navel. Notice the size of Vishnu who is larger than the others because he is more powerful. Here again we see Lakshmi holding the feet of Vishnu, inspiring him to dream up the universe. Brahma turns himself into space and time, making creation possible. There also is a demon that threatens to kill Brahma and jeopardize creation. These are divine stories and reaction to them and engagement is physical. Now let's discuss the Ashanta Caves. These are carved like Egyptian Middle Kingdom tombs and temples directly from living rock. The narrative episodes of Buddha's past lives or bodhisattvas are found here. Bodhisattvas put off enlightenment to help others attain it. Paintings from this area are rare. Bodhisattvas, again, 
are enlightened beings who postpone nirvana to help others. They are distinguished from Buddha by princely garments, bejeweled crowns, large earrings, pearl necklaces, armbands, and bracelets. These rock sculptures travel west along the Silk Road. The Silk Road was a trade route from China to the West where goods and ideas were traded. Buddhist travelers also carved from the rock cliffs statues that were nearly 200 feet high of Buddha for protection along the pilgrimage. Moving now to the city of Bamiyan, Afghanistan, which was a West in trade and religious center, where we find some of the first colossal Buddhas. This statue was originally covered in gold pigment and pilgrims can enter the cave and travel through passages all the way up to the shoulders. We have also seen colossal statues in ancient Egypt. As we pilgrimage to the heavens, we circumambulate around Buddha and then travel back down as an act of meditation. This circumambulation is central to Buddhist worship. In 2001, the Taliban considered the statue idolatrous and destroyed it. In 2015, we saw ISIS destroying Assyrian art that they considered to be idolatrous or because they were at a war zone. Many of the art we discussed from this region that is in conflict like the Middle East and parts of Asia do not survive. Let's now learn about Hindu temples. temples can be seen throughout the villages, towns, and cities of India. A temple can be a simple structure by the side of the road or an entire complex of buildings. Regardless of its size, the Hindu temple is essentially a dwelling place for the gods. A principal deity resides at the heart of each temple, like a king or queen in their palace. Other deities, attendants, and mythical figures can also be seen as part of the temple structure. Surrounding the temple are stalls selling offerings and souvenirs such as fruit, flowers, sweets, and postcards. The atmosphere around the temple is lively and boisterous. The interior of a Hindu temple is not designed to hold large congregations. Worshippers come and go in small groups through a hallway leading to an inner sanctuary. Here, the image or symbol of the main deity is located. In an active temple, statues of the deities are covered with garlands and draped with rich fabrics. Above the sanctuary rises a central tower, often brightly painted. The shape of the tower resembles the mythical mountain home of the gods. Other features of temples include sacred bathing ponds, walled enclosures, and gateways in a variety of shapes and sizes. Here, at Madurai in southern India, the gateways tower above the temple complex and are covered with statues. 
some temples are no longer in active use. At Khajuraho in central India, tourists now flock to see celebrated images of gods and loving couples adorning the exterior walls. In Konarak, near the eastern coast, are the remains of one of the largest temples ever built in India. It was dedicated to the sun god Surya. The original tower no longer survives, and we can only imagine its size from the smaller buildings that still stand. The immense variety of temples throughout India is the result of local styles and preferences and centuries of architectural developments, each attest to the artistry of countless masons and sculptors. The sculptures of deities seen in the Asian Art Museum were once part of an active Hindu temple. They adorned the exterior walls, interior spaces, entranceways, high wall niches, and inner sanctuaries. The northern style temple relates to the shape of a mountain. The curvilinear shikara or dome is located over the Garbhagriha or inner shrine. This temple is dedicated to Shiva. The stone terrace is an entryway. You enter more deeply before seeing the god himself or herself. There are three mandapas, pillared outdoor halls, that precede the Garbhagriha. The Garbhagriha, again, is the womb chamber that protects the god. The shikara, or dome, is also covered or surrounded by smaller towers that recede in size and obscure the shape of the main dome. The domes over mandapas grow progressively taller to give the impression of an ascent up a mountain. The temple is covered with about 600 figures that are around three feet high of gods in erotic postures. There are loving couples on the entrances to the temples that have many interpretations on the meaning. They can relate to two new traditions in Hinduism, Tantra and Bhakti. The Tantra is esoteric, relating to self-identity with the deity. And there is no separation between self and divine. With Tantra, the connection is seen as erotic. Bhakti is devotional, where there is a personal, loving relationship with the God. There is union with the gods and mortals, and it can be represented in erotic imagery that equals devotion and unity with the gods. These couples can be seen kissing, groping, engaging in sexual intercourse with the gods, where they are communed with in a very physical way. The symbolism is male and female union. The union of the individual soul with the supreme soul. In this sculpture,
from the Baroque period by Bernini, connected with Catholicism. St. Teresa described her encounter with the angel in a way that paralleled the physical act of sex. Angkor Wat has some of the world's largest religious monuments. Its name means holy temple. It is both a Hindu and a Buddhist temple and was the capital of medieval Cambodia. It was built by Sarivarman II. Its central tower is a temple mount and it has five towers they represent the five peaks of Mount Murray, the sacred mountain, which is also the center of spiritual and the physical universe. Rulers added to the complex over time. Each of the Khmer kings built a temple mountain at Angkor and installed his personal god, Shiva, Vishnu, or the Buddha, on top and gave the god part of his own royal name implying that the king was a manifestation of the deity. Angkor Wat was an engineering masterpiece. Everything the Khmer had learned over hundreds of years of temple building and engineering great water projects came together in the construction of the jewel of their civilization. Most striking of all was the scale of the construction. Angkor Wat covers an area more than four times larger than the Vatican City. And this created huge challenges for Surya Varman's engineers. During the monsoon, the land becomes saturated and expands. After the monsoon, it dries out and contracts. Laterite was a core building material of all Khmer temples, stretching right back to the Rong Chen Temple in the Kulan Hills. Now it was being used to help solve the Khmer's greatest engineering challenge. How do you build high with such heavy material as the sandstone? Well, look behind the facade and what do you see? You see that it's filled with this very lightweight, porous material called laterite. It's a kind of ancient breeze block. But Richard Engelhardt thinks that the use of laterite was only part of the solution. He believes that Angkor Wat is still standing today because of the water surrounding the Great Temple. In the ideal Khmer structure, you cannot separate the building from the moat. They are inextricable. They are symbiotic and you cannot have one without the other, both in the terms of the design and the conception of what we are building and the civil engineering features of it. The construction of the moat surrounding Angkor Wat was a huge operation. It's estimated laborers removed enough silt and sand to fill the Empire State Building one and a half times. Its perimeter is over three miles, and it is 650 feet wide. Then, the moat fills with water. Water is heavier. It's more dense than laterite and earth. So the weight of the water is actually heavier than the weight of the materials you've taken out. Richard believes the weight of the water in the moat pushes back against the downward force of the stone temple. The moat is essential to the success of the entire structure. Without the moat, the structure could not stand. The, the two are completely part of one holistic engineering system.